if you'll just play hard this day and age, you'll stand out. Like it's amazing. We there's so much travel baseball, and it, you watch kids barely jog onto the field, and the game drags, and nobody plays with any excitement. Um, I'm not saying you gotta. Artiaga drives one to center. Miller hustling over, diving catch by Ian Miller. A great catch. Three, two, one. Hello, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of the Nine Hole Podcast. This is Ian Miller. Um, pretty recently, we've been having uh, the opportunity to speak to um, you know some leaders in the game of college baseball. Um, today, I have the honor and the privilege of having Cliff Godwin on, um, head coach for ECU, uh, the Pirates. Man, coach, what is going on with you? How you doing? I'm doing great, Ian. Thanks for having me. I uh, really appreciate you taking the time to have me on. Oh man, it's 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 a pleasure. So I wanted to just get into um, a little bit about how you came up in the game, um, specifically. Um, you know, obviously, we'll start at at when you caught right for ECU. You were a catcher, um, graduated magna cum laude, right? Am I? I, I hope I'm saying that right, um, <laughs> man. But you were, you know, two time academic All American, uh, first team All Conference senior year, um, man. What what was that like, and uh, how how has that been able to kind of you know, translate over into being a top tier uh, D1 coach? Well, I think it starts back with my childhood, the way I was raised. Uh, my dad was a high school basketball coach for over 30 years. So actually my first love was to play basketball. And I played basketball, football, and baseball in high school. My dad was the athletic background pushing me to work hard. My mom was the academic piece. Um, she was a school nurse. So I had both my parents at my high school. So if I got in trouble, at high school, they knew about it before I did, which was uh, not uh, very convenient, as you can imagine. Uh, my grandparents were farmers, so in the summers, I, I worked in the tobacco field. So um, I was taught work ethic, uh, no excuses at a very young age, um, much earlier than when travel baseball was prevalent. I played American Legion ball in the summer, but I mean, I had to work on the farm up until whenever I had to leave to go play Legion ball. And if I struck out three times, nobody said, hey, were you too tired to, to play tonight? They just said, hey, get your tail up tomorrow morning, go to work and figure out how you can play better, which I appreciate because the only reason I'm where I am today is because of work ethic. Um, not the smartest guy in the room. Um, yeah, I was an academic All-American twice, but that's because my parents pushed me to do well in school. So um, I wanted to be a, a college basketball player. That was my dream. So. Um, I was actually a better basketball and football player in high school than I was a baseball player because I spent more time in those sports than I did baseball. And my high school coach, uh, James Rabbit Fulgham, who's in the North Carolina Sports Hall of Fame, had sent guys to East Carolina who were good baseball players uh, for Coach Gary Overton at the time. And the only small Division I scholarship I had for baseball was East Carolina. I had some other offers to play basketball and football at smaller schools, but still I had more interest in football and basketball than I did baseball. But my high school coach pretty much twisted Coach Gary Overton's arm to give me an opportunity. Um, I had always told my mom that I would never go to East Carolina because uh, she went to school here and it was 25 minutes from home. So. I didn't want my mom to be in my dorm room every weekend, but of course, uh, as most teenagers, you eat those words that you <laughs> tell your parents that you're not going to do. So I come to East Carolina. I'm not skilled from baseball. I'm an athlete, and I redshirt my freshman year under Coach Gary Overton, and uh, that summer, they hire a new coach, Keith LeClaire. And from day one, he talked about taking ECU baseball and playing in the College World Series. Up until that point, and this isn't a knock against anybody, but I didn't even know that ECU baseball could play in the College World Series. That wasn't something that was talked about. But I did know that I redshirted on a below average team and they're hiring a guy and he's talking about going to the College World Series. So uh, I, I do have some common sense and go, well, I better get my crap together pretty quickly or I'm probably not going to be here. And mm -hmm. there were 12 in my freshman class. I was one of three that survived uh, Coach LeClaire. Um, and that's not a knock. He just was trying to weed out the, the people that weren't totally committed. I mean, we went through Navy SEAL workouts and all kinds of crazy stuff that fall. And we weren't good his first year. We were 30 and 29 um, and had to beat Mount Olive, which is a Division II school, uh, twice to be one game above 500. But the next year they brought in their first recruiting class and 
you know, in that class, Eric Backage, who's the head coach at Clemson, Nick Schnabel, who's the assistant at Clemson, um, Chad Tracy, who played in the big leagues for eight and a half years. Uh, a lot of guys turned the program around. Um, and then we were number one seeds in regionals for the next three years. And we couldn't host here at East Carolina because we had pretty much a high school field where Clark LeClaire Stadium is today. Um, my senior year, we uh, hosted the regional in Wilson, North Carolina, won the regional, and then uh, lost to Tennessee um, in the Super Regional, which we hosted um, in Kinston, North Carolina, because we were the seventh national seed. And uh, I made the last out of uh, game two of the Super Regional. So I was the time run at the plate. Um, we actually blew leads in both games. And uh, in game two, like I said, I was the time run at the plate. It was a 1 0 count, 1 0 change up. I was sitting on it. So left-handed hitter had 15 home runs on the year, and I just got it to second base. Oh. I was going for it. I just missed it. And uh, that was the end of my college career. Um, that was actually the last game Coach LeClaire coached in a uniform because that fall he was diagnosed with Lou Gehrig's disease and ended up having to step down after the next year, and then he passed away in 2006. So I tell you all that because – that's what ECU baseball, the foundation was built, in my opinion, when Coach LeClaire was here and the work ethic and the tenacity and all those things. And um, the teams I played on, I was a very small piece of it, but we helped raise the money for Clark LeClaire Stadium, which opened up in 05. Um, I would have never been a part of something that cool if I hadn't come to East Carolina, played for Coach LeClaire, my best friends in the world um, were ECU baseball players, the That's ones awesome. I stood in their wedding and uh, I tell people all the time I wouldn't trade it for any amount of money because I'm so close to those guys still today at, at the age of 45. Mm, that makes sense to me. Um, <laughs> I actually had uh, an, an ex ECU baseball uh, player stand at my wedding as well. Um, I heard a whole lot about the program, Jack Reinheimer, I think before maybe you, you took over right at the helm. Right. So in between the time I played and when I took the head coaching job here. Yep. So, uh, but Hey, big leaguer. Hey, yeah. yes, sir. Still yeah. kicking too. Still going for it. Um, so I heard a lot about obviously, uh, the work ethic and the drive. Um, we'll get into that a little bit, uh, with the coaching philosophy, how you lead, uh, your young men. I'm excited to hear about that. Um, so after you were done playing, uh, at ECU, you played two years, uh, in pro ball, and then you you kind of started um, your your coaching career, right? So you, you did one year um, at high school, um, you were assistant coach, right? And then you jumped straight to the D1 level, which is, right. which is crazy. I mean, that, yeah. that's awesome. That's crazy. That's <laughs> awesome, man. So uh, UNC Wilmington for two years, um, then you went, to, you went to Vanderbilt, director of ops, um, two seasons, Notre Dame, two seasons, LSU, College World Series trip, uh, which is in, insane, right? Then you, then you go to UCF, the associate uh, head coach spot, recruiting coordinator, Ole Miss, um, man, and then and then you end up here at ECU, um, and you had another College World Series appearance, uh, obviously at, at Ole Miss, man. So, was was being the head coach, um, you know, at, at a, a big time D one pro, you know, big time D one program, and an established D one head coach, was that always kind of the the dream? Was that always the goal? Um, and, and maybe when did that like set in? It's funny you said that. I was actually just talking to one of our former players from last year. And when I made that last out in the Super Regional, I was actually in graduate school. Um, but I had played sports my whole life, and I knew uh, I wasn't going to get drafted. You know, I, I got to play independent ball, not a knock against indie ball players. But, yeah. you know, I wasn't that good. I mean, I was pretty good, but not good enough to be drafted. And it was like you're going 100 miles an hour in a car, and you run into a brick wall, and it's like reality sets in like, I don't get to play at East Carolina anymore. I don't know what I'm going to do. Obviously, I could just go into the business world, but I wasn't ready for that. So independent ball for me was kind of a placeholder why I finished up my master's. I got my MBA at East Carolina. Um, and then I graduated in December of 2002. And um, I just knew I wanted to do something with sports. So I uh, was planning on getting into college coaching. But at that time in December, as you know, that's not a good time to get into the college game. And um, long story short, one of my best friends was the head basketball coach at Kenston High School. I had gone to watch a game at a holiday tournament, and the principal of the high school was the basketball coach at Kenston High School when I played. And he just stopped me and he said, 
hey, uh, what are you doing? And I said, well, I just finished up my master's and I want to get into college coaching. And within 30 seconds, he had offered me the assistant coaching job at Kenson High School, creating a uh, tutor position that paid like a teacher and the head coach at the high school was going to retire after the season. So he said, hey, after this year, you'll be the head coach. And I'm like, all this in 30 seconds. So, hey, can I just go home and think about it? And But people had told me that if I ever got into high school, I'd never get into college. And so that was weighing on me a little bit. Um, but at the time I was making no money and didn't have medical insurance. So I said, well, I'm about to go coach baseball and get paid to do it. I'm in, yeah. you know, like yeah. I'm in. And then the opportunity opened up that summer for UNC Wilmington. So I went from getting paid to, uh, not really getting paid. I made $8,000, uh, for an entire year as the volunteer assistant at UNCW. And I tell people that because, you know, people look at me now or look at head coaches, Hey, you make a lot of money. Well, Hey man, it wasn't. It wasn't always that easy. Um, you had to put in your time. You had to put in the work to to get to where I am today. But your original question, yeah, I wanted to be a head coach, but people would always ask me as an assistant, hey, what's your dream job? And I never could answer that question because the way I was raised, and of course, before social media, it was almost tunnel vision for me. If, hey, look, my parents told me to do a good job, but whoever I'm working for, and if you do mm. a good enough job, somebody will notice. And of course, the stars have to align for you to be able to come back and coach at your alma mater. And I never thought that probably was a reality just because ECU baseball had been good enough in the years, you know, previous that, you know, I don't I don't know if somebody's not going to win enough for them to get let go. And then you have to be in a position in your career where they want you to. So everything had to work out. And I know God had his hand in it for sure for me to be able to come back and coach it in my opinion, the best college baseball program in the world because I'm biased. <laughs> you know, yeah. I played here and I love it here. So I bet, man, that's, that's fantastic. So I obviously um, like the self-realization, um, having an idea of, of your capabilities uh, and your athletic abilities, maybe having an idea of, you know, your ceiling, right? Being self-aware as an athlete, as, you know, as a man, everything um, that kind of comes into being able to make those tough decisions and, and be able to kind of weigh the odds, right? Um, I'm, I'm sure that's big. Um, maybe what you, what you teach these guys, right? Strengths and weaknesses, um, try to attack the things they're good or, you know, bad at, right? Build yeah. on that stuff. Um, so I wanted to touch a little bit on uh, the academic side of things, right? So, so you just, Man, the NBA is is insane as well, right? So, two time academic All American, magna cum laude. Again, hope I'm saying that right. And an yes. NBA, uh, man. So, I'm reading even more of this team academic excellence award, seven straight. So, so your team had the highest GPA in your conference for seven years straight. Um, how big of a role does does academics and and being a solid student athlete uh, play in your organization for your team and and how you mold these young men? Well, when I got hired in the summer of 2014, and this is kind of embarrassing for me to say, it only had been tracked for the previous seven seasons. So maybe you can talk to Jack. He was probably on one of those teams, but ECU baseball had never made a 3-0 GPA, team GPA. So I'm sitting there, I'm like, excuse my language, how in the hell is that? Like, we're, that's going to be our first goal. So um, me and the coaching staff got together our first goal, first team meeting, hey, we're going to make a 3-0. Team GPA this fall. So we got a 3.05 that first fall, Ian, and you'd have thought we won the World Series. <laughs> no offense to that group. And if the if that group team watches it, they would be like, man, coach, man, totally changed. And I was just on top of them about study hall. And man, it was a great accomplishment. And then that spring, we fell a little bit below 3-0. And then after that, we've been really consistent. So for six and a half years, um, because I know what we're going to make this semester that we're in right now, it'll be over a 3.4. So we've had 3.4 team GPA or higher for six and a half years. Now I'm not taking the credit for that. That's our support staff. That's our, the guys we're recruiting. They're, you know, committed to working hard, but I'm a big believer in you have to learn how to do stuff that you don't necessarily like to do. And in every first team meeting that we have, I ask the question, how many guys love school in here? And as you can imagine, how many hands go up? None. And I go, great. I go, I didn't love school either. And I was a two-time academic All-American. So you have mm. to do your best. And if you're a three-five student, be a three-five student. If you're a three-two-five student, be a three-two-five student. But of course, we have four-zero students as well. So uh, I just want them to do the best they can. And 
make sure they're paying attention to detail, turning in all their assignments, all that stuff. And if you do that, sit in the front of the class, have a relationship with your professor, hey, the odds are, are going to work for you. Yeah. Yeah. No kid. So has that, I mean, just thinking about kind of what I experienced in college, I was, I, I walked on at Wagner College, Staten Island, New York. So a little different, maybe in terms of, you know, the classes offered kind of the, the rigorous schedule, man, I'm sure it's, it's crazier, the bigger the school you get and, and you know, the more academic prestige, you know, the, the better the program, whatever it is, man. But has, has, has that been a big challenge kind of maintaining that level, level of academic success and, you know, the, the, the top tier division one baseball level of competition, man, I'm just thinking about it on my end, like, man, just trying to balance study hall and some classes and, you know, practices and stuff was a challenge for me. And I was an average student. Like, has that been a, a pretty big challenge for, for you and your student athletes? I would say that first fall semester to get that 3.05 was probably the biggest challenge that we've had. And then we just, through recruiting, of course, we've made it a, an emphasis and Got we've it. talked about it and told them what their expect, the expectation level is. And, um, one of the best things that we have done in the fall of 17, which it, the spring of 17 is the worst season that we've had here, um, we started implementing daily schedules. So the night before the next day when you're getting ready to go to bed, just write out in a 30-minute increment everything that you have to do the next day. So it makes you really efficient. Yeah, to, to get started with anything, you know, it's the start that stops most people, you know, yeah. just starting something new. Um you know, you have to hold their hand a little bit, but just blocking out 30 minutes. So then they're not wasting mental energy about, hey, what time I got to wake up tomorrow? What time am I going to eat breakfast? What time is my first class? What time do I have to be at the field? What time are we lifting weights? What time is study hall? Really, you can have it on your phone or you can have it on a sheet of paper and you're just going through your day, checking things off. And since that fall, now you're talking about a really consistent program academically and also on the baseball field, um, which success leaves clues, as you know. So that's one thing that has been a staple in our program since the fall of 17. Big time. So that's structured, right? Being yeah. able to teach these young men kind of how to keep a keep a schedule and stay on on track could help right. with the discipline, could help them like if they're going through anything off the field, whatever it is, and they turn their brain off for a little bit, they at least have some structure to get through their day, right? They can maybe rely on the calendar, man. That's awesome. I feel like that's something that, um, you know, I've kind of just inherited that trait or that skill, right? The, the calendar um, it has been really beneficial for me and kind of being able to be like more productive, uh, you know, better, better well, in, this, in this era of life, as you know, I mean, how many more distractions are there today than when I was in college or when you were in college um, with social media I and mean, everything's on your phone. And I, I talk to our guys all the time, like, don't tell me that you want to play in the major leagues. And I look at a daily schedule and you're playing Fortnite for four hours. Like I'm okay with you mm. playing Fortnite, you know, but let's limit it to an hour a day. But doing the daily schedule actually gives them more free time if they stay within the schedule. Like if you put down an hour to take a nap, hey, keep it an hour so you don't mess up the rest of your day. I love it. I love that. Um, that fires me up right there. Coaching <laughs> philosophy, right? So, um, you know, how how you were brought up in the game, kind of um, the level of academic success, the level of athletic success you've been able to, you know, to accrue, you've been able to pass on, uh, you know, to your student athletes, to, to your players, man. So, serving others is is a big one. Uh, I think just reading up on on kind of, you know, your bio, your history, what you've been able to accomplish so far um, and and being so young, right? That It's going to be insane to see, you know, what you're able to do moving forward, but coaching philosophy, right? Serving others seems seems to be pretty big, right? As, as a foundation kind of a, what, you know, what you're passing on. So you guys are community oriented. Um, so I'm reading over 6,000 hours with programs, uh, in, in Pitt County, right? Food banks, disaster relief, make a wish you're donating your time, uh, your team's time to, to better others, um, and to kind of put others in front of, you know, you and your needs, right? That's, that's incredible. Um, just getting on your Twitter, seeing what you're about, um, your faith, um, you know, the Bible verses, the pictures that you will be, you know, you will, you will post that have a positive message, um, with stuff that's relevant today. Um, uh, that's huge. That's amazing. It's, it's great to see. It's great to read. Um, I was just actually reading one today about, I, I think it was like two days ago, you posted about something with wealth, right. And, and being smart with money. Um, that's awesome. Right. So it's all positive. Um, is that all kind of mixed into the coaching philosophy? So, um, has your faith, um, and the serving others mindset, is that a massive part of the coaching philosophy and how you're able to kind of bring out the best in everybody? 
It is. Uh, I won't say that, you know, when I was, you know, younger as an assistant, that probably wasn't at the forefront. Not that I wasn't serving our players, but I wasn't able to articulate it probably. Um, my view on life, uh, the game of baseball, probably when I was a young assistant, it was life or death to me um, from the standpoint of, hey, if we lose a game, I'm miserable to everybody involved um, as I was as a player. Um, if I could go back and probably change some things, I would change that. Um, and then really uh, COVID hits in 2020. I, I grew up in a church and uh, I had a preacher that I really enjoyed when I went through confirmation class. And when you're a Methodist, uh, they change preachers every five years. Well, about the time I was getting into high school, you know, they bring in a, no, a new preacher and um, I couldn't tell you what his name is. And I hope if this guy listens to it, that he didn't take offense to it, but it, it, I just didn't get engaged. So now I'm sitting in church and I'm counting down the the time to go eat lunch. And then so I can go play pickup basketball in the gym. You know, that was what my Sundays entailed. And so then you get into college and you know how college is. It's just not at the forefront. We would have some devotionals here at East Carolina. We had a guy named Chuck Young that ran SportWorks and we would go to his house every Monday night. He'd feed us and have a devotional, but it wasn't in my day to day because I was worldly. You know, I was into, you know, doing the stuff that college kids do and not proud about a lot of the stuff that I did in college, but that's what I did. I worked hard on the baseball field, but it just wasn't a priority and then got into coaching and it was kind of the same thing. And COVID hit in 2020 and a guy walked in my office who's a donor East Carolina, Mike Amen. And he uh, just said, hey, Cliff, you've been on uh, been on my heart, man, on my mind. I've been praying for you. I know how much, you know, coaching baseball at East Carolina means to you. And at that time, I actually was in a pretty good headspace and he put on my desk a John Maxwell leadership Bible and it changed my life um, in a good way. And I really started looking into how I could serve people better and really change the, the, the way I look at things. And no offense, nobody's more competitive, in my opinion, than I am. But we're, we're playing a game of baseball. Like hey, there's a bigger picture, life, faith, all that stuff. I, I don't push faith on our guys. Um, we have some guys that take it upon amongst themselves and have a Bible study. And we still have sport works here and stuff. But um Nothing's better when you now I'm getting old enough where, you know, I've been a head coach going into my 10th season where now the guys that were in those first teams that we had here are coming back and are married or have kids and the pride they have and um, just the, the shared experiences we have. Um, and when I have rings on my desk with championships, it's the relationships that I look at. It's not even the piece of jewelry that I'm looking at is the, the, the guys that shared those experiences, good and bad, you know, that yeah. we went through. So um, my philosophy has totally changed and uh, it's part of growing up and maturing and just growing stronger in my faith. I love that. I love that. So the first, I mean, at, at least in baseball, um, pro ball was the first time I've ever really experienced, you know, faith being, you know, involved in baseball or being offered in baseball, right? So, we, you know, you would have, um, you know, study groups and, and there would be a, a preacher or, or, you know, pastor per team, right? Right, Depending on, on where you were at. So that was really my first, first experience there. But man, I remember, I, I remember being, I, I would pray for every single thing to happen positively for me in baseball, <laughs> right? To the point where I felt like I was almost selfish, right? Yeah. Um, I, I genuinely remember making you know, a, a decision in high school, I was going to, you know, play major league baseball. That was going to be my thing. And I remember since, since high school, since high school, through high school, through college, through the minor leagues, through the big leagues, um, I said a prayer every half inning that I went out into the outfield, every half inning before every at bat, uh, in, in professional baseball, I'd take a knee, um, in, in the, in the circle before I walked up the home plate, just saying, thank you. Like just extremely grateful. So it's cool. Man, I just thought it was cool. I really wanted to ask you about that. Um, I, I think it's I think it's cool that that you're open about that, um, and I think it's cool that you kind of incorporate that in, into the philosophy uh, serving others. Um, and I wasn't sure kind of how that dynamic worked. I wasn't sure, you know, what's off limits, what's on limits, depending on you know what team and who you're well, affiliated and, with. And it's, and look, it's uh, it's a tricky thing, right? I mean, yeah. the world we live in, and me working at a state university. But if somebody fires me because of my faith one day. 
then God wants me to do something else. Amen. And uh, I'm not afraid of it. And uh, I'm not going to run from it. I'm not going to force anybody to um, go to a devotional or anything like that. But at the end of the day, um, I do believe that there's a place that we can all go to that's a lot better than this earthly place. So I want to make sure I'm doing my part while I'm here. Love it. Love it. Um, so you are you are entering your 10th year as the head coach, right? That's that is uh, that is respectable right there. Um, having, uh, you know, longevity like that at a, at a top tier division one program is is an honor. Right. And that's not something that's that's handed out very easily. Right. So I wanted to talk to you a little bit um, about, you know, leadership, um, which obviously you've portrayed that you're a fantastic leader. So uh, so far in the in the past nine years, right, you're entering the 10th the year, uh, seven NCAA regionals, four super regionals, 22 players drafted. Uh, and a 673 winning percentage, uh, man. What's what is and, and secret sauce isn't the right way to say it. But what's the <laughs> secret sauce um, to being that good of a leader and and putting up those type of accolades, those types of numbers, and getting the most out of like impressionable young men that could be molded into into better you know leaders. Well, number one, you got to surround yourself with uh, unbelievable support staff. That's coaches, athletic trainers, strength coaches, academic advisors. As you know, it takes a village. Uh, mm -hmm. I can tell you that. And then when you're going through the recruiting process, you, you're honest with what we're about, that we do work hard. Um, if you don't want to work hard, don't come to East Carolina. Um, we are going to have discipline in our program. We're going to win championships, but we're going to do it the right way. Um, and obviously in this climate of college athletics, it, it's been harder, you know, um, but the relationship piece, I would say the thing that I learned very quickly when you get the head coach title, you know, I was an assistant coach. I was a hitting coach. I was a catching coach. Kids just walk into your office. Hey, coach, let's go hit. Hey, can we get some extra work in? Well, I was the hitting coach and catching coach when I was first hired as a head coach, cause that's what my passion is. And nobody walks into your office because you got that title. So then I had to start, hey, basically scheduling out meetings with individual players. Mm -hmm. And um, now, you know, I have a leadership group that uh, we meet with pretty consistently. Um, in the fall, we meet once a week and really don't talk baseball. And this is with the entire team. It's just about what successful people do, what leaders do. I mean, we could be watching videos on Dabo Sweeney or Michael Jordan or Kobe Bryant or Derek Jeter. You pick the litter. It doesn't have to be baseball related. And this is what successful people do. And, you know, like I said early, success leaves clues. And so we just try to flood them with that information because, as you know, there are on social media a lot and social media at times can be very negative. Um, so we're just trying to flood them with positive reinforcement that if you do things the right way and treat people like you want to be treated, then success doesn't happen overnight and hard work. You can work your tail off and not get the results you're looking for two weeks from now, or even, you know, two months or even two years from now, I tell them the story where, yeah, I redshirted. Well, I wasn't an all conference player until my fifth year at East Carolina. Um, there's a lot of hard work that went into it. And I probably was too dumb to even realize like, Hey, you're working hard and you're still not a good player. Like I just, that was just entrenched in me, you know? So, um, but if you have a little bit of patience and you can keep to those processes, then you will have success if you work hard consistently. Fantastic. That, you know, resilience seems to, to be the, the, uh, I guess, adjective there, man. That's fantastic. Right. Um, using the example, um, you know, from your college career, right. The, you, you registered your first year, um, and ended up, you know, having a stellar college career. You started as a high school coach out when you're, when you were done playing, you're ending up, you know, where you're at right now, obviously like resilience is key. Being able to kind of portray that to the next generation is huge. I absolutely love that. Um, you you had mentioned something earlier as well. Uh, don't come to ECU if you're not willing to work, right? Because we're going to get after it. Right. What is that like? Uh, what are your practices like? Are they intense? Man, are you training to fail? Or are you training to like get these guys to to feel themselves a little bit? Obviously, you want to pump the confidence up. You want to make these boys feel good. But you're all, you're I'm, I'm sure there's a dichotomy there, right? You also want to train, you know, to challenge them. Yeah, I would say our practices, we try to make them pretty tough, you know, um, especially in the fall. Um, you squeeze them, 
because you want the games to be easier. Um, I don't yell and scream at the games unless it's an umpire, which I'm trying to work on a little bit. Um, I, I tell people all the time, nobody's trying to make an error. Nobody's trying to strike out. Nobody's trying to give up the home run. Um, now, at practice, we're making sure they're very detail-oriented and staying on them with their detailed processes. So it's almost like recess when the game comes on. Hey, man, you guys go play. Um, and that's the way – I coach and uh, people look at me and I mean, I guess I have an intense looking face, but you know, I look intense in the game, but I'm really pretty calm because the hay's in the barn, so to speak. Like, yeah, you, you've gone over scouting reports and what the pitcher is going to do um, to our, you know, hitters and, you know, our pitching coaches talk to our pitchers about what their offense is like. But once they say play ball, man, like that's what you train them to do. And really uh, the best teams I've coached, you stay out of their way. You know, mm. when we won 20 games in a row in 2022. People were like, hey, what do you say to them? I said, nothing. I stay out of the way and just let them play baseball. I said, why would I interject myself into this thing? Hey, this thing is is rolling. I love it. That's a fantastic way of looking at it, right? Don't I mean, you don't have to fix what's uh, not broken, right? Yeah, yeah. That's, yeah. that's great. Um, so you were a catching coordinator. I, you know, you, you handled the catching duties. Obviously, you, you played catcher. Um, so you have a bunch of background there. Um, I've been I've been working with a kid or two, um, a high school catcher, right? And he wants to put an emphasis on, uh, you know, quick hands, getting better at the transfers, getting better at receiving, getting you know, getting the pop time down. Um, aside from you know, just, just working on that transfer type stuff, working heavy ball, uh, all that stuff, man. How would you, what kind of tips or drills uh, would you say to catchers to, to try to get that pop time down? Well, first off, um, and when I was a volunteer assistant at UNCW, I really uh, messed up a freshman, in my opinion, defensively, because of course you're the young catching coach. You want to put your mark on him. And, mm. you know, he was a better offensive player than he was a catcher. And so I'm trying to work with him receiving, blocking, and throwing. And all of a sudden, you can just see the, the mind just spinning and, you know, smoke coming out of his head, so to speak. And that was one thing I learned, like, number one, um, let, let's focus on what the most important things are. And I know everybody wants to have a great pop time, but you played baseball for a long time. At least at our level, we're going to control the running game on the mound. So we got to make sure we receive and block first and then mm. – the throwing's really the last piece because um, number one, everybody can't steal bases. Um, I couldn't steal bases because I wasn't fast. So if I got to first base, hey dude, you could throw a two-two down the second base and get me out. Um, but just specifically on that, um, I, I love catchers that are accurate, man. Like mm. you can throw one eights down there, but if it's twenty-five percent accuracy, then. Dude, let's get it down to a one nine five and just be accurate every time. And yeah. I mean, really, we tell our guys if you can be two o two o five with the way our pitch pitchers control the running game, and you can be accurate, dude. We're gonna throw out a lot of guys. Now we actually have the luxury we have three catchers that have really good arms, so at times they can be a little bit less than that. But I still I get ticked off like, hey man, make sure we're accurate, and especially in all our drill work because just like hitting. It's going to speed up, dude. Like, nobody's going to ever say, hey, go faster in the game. Like, dude, the adrenaline's going, and you're going to get rid of the baseball uh, pretty quickly. But if you're not accurate, then it doesn't matter. So um, I probably didn't really answer your question, but, I mean, uh, accuracy is a big piece to it um, for me. Um, for sure. Because I think they grow up in a pro-style workout deal, and everybody wants to know, the well, half of them cheat, and they're, you know, turned sideways, where you can't turn sideways in the game when the guy's throwing 95 miles an hour. Um, so, but accuracy is a big part, part for me. Love it. Um, as, as I was progressing through my career, as it was kind of winding down, right, coming to an end, I feel like I can kind of relate to you a little bit. I had that self-awareness where I was like, man, maybe it's time. Maybe it's time. You know what I mean? Maybe my, maybe my time is better served elsewhere. I can I can do more. I can help others, whatever it is. Um, but obviously, I was signing free agent contracts, you know, one year minor league free agent contracts, much like much like Jack Reinheimer. We had just talked about, um, you know, where you can sign and, and go anywhere. So having that contract is huge. It's a big weight off the shoulders. It's a breath of fresh air, man. I'd love to talk a little bit about a year and a half ago, uh, July 2022, you had signed an extension through 2029. Man, what does that mean to you? What does it what does it do for you? Is it is that a breath of fresh air, a little weight off the shoulders? And what are you hoping to be able to accomplish in that time? 
Well, Ian, I, I would, I, I'm going to probably not say what you want me to, but it's not really pressure off me because uh, I have high expectations for myself. And, and for me, it's a year to year deal, <laughs> you know, like that's the way I look at it day to day. Yeah. Uh, we had a sport administrator here one time when, you know, the whole four year scholarship thing was coming up and, um, you know, we were having conversations back and forth and the administrator looked at me and said, would you take a one year deal? I said, yeah, I'd take a one year deal. Because if I'm not doing a good enough job, I'd want somebody to let me go. Mm. And um, actually, my contract rolls over every time we go to a regional. So it's a seven-year deal that just keeps rolling. So I never look at it that way. Um, you know, in the landscape that we're in, um, I don't want to ever get too comfortable. Because mm. if you're getting comfortable, man, we're going to get beat. That's right. Yeah. Complacency is death right there, right? Yeah. Um yeah, no, I, I feel that. So you, you've you been around the game for a while. You've been around, you know, top-tier players. Um, you've coached top-tier players. They've been on your team. You've played against them. Um, man, what, what do the best players do differently than their peers to separate themselves and take their game as far as they can go that you've seen, that you've experienced? I would say that the best ones have – some kind of innate discipline or competitiveness that other guys don't have. Of course they have to have talent, but you know, a couple of our big leaguers uh, that just made it to big leagues re recently, two different guys, Alec Burleson is a competitive as a human being. He's probably more like me than any player I've ever coached where he, you know, um, hated losing more than he likes winning, mm -hmm. which I've tried to work on that for myself. <laughs> but for him, the reason he's in the big leagues, it was, First time, and this is just a funny story, first time I ever watched him play, his going into his junior year of high school, he's playing at the University of North Carolina travel baseball and uh, played for the South Charlotte Panthers. And Don Hutchison, who's been around a lot of really good players, walks up to him and goes, hey, Cliff, this is the best hitter that's ever come through in our organization. And I look over, and if you can kind of picture what Babe Ruth looked like, and I'm like, the, the uh, chunky kid over here? That's the guy you're talking about? And then he has no power and he hits a single in the right field and he had to run straight through the bag because he's like a five flat. And I'm like, Don, like, Hey man, he, he's got decent bat to ball skills, but th this guy, like, I mean, division one high caliber baseball, I'm telling you, he can hit and Burley pitch too. So he's left-handed and he gets mm. on the mound. He's like 80, 82, but can really pitch. And so we start following him as a pitcher, end up committing him and say, Hey, look, you're definitely going to pitch, but we're going to let you hit in the fall. And then next thing I know, I'm like, that guy's going to hit in the three hole for us as a freshman because his hand eye coordination is unbelievable. And then he shaped his body up and you can imagine the workload he took on when he's pitching and playing a oh. position and would pitch in the rotation or close. And, you know, he's hitting in the three hole playing outfield, playing first base and, you know, scouts, his knot was he doesn't hit for power. And I go, hey, man, when he can lift like a position player and he doesn't have to go out there and throw 80 to 100 innings for us, I promise you he's going to be able to hit for some power in professional baseball. And the rest is history. Versus Gavin Williams, who's extremely talented, learned how to work at his craft a little more consistently, learned how to spin the baseball, always threw hard, but we are able to refine him. And I think they all have something a little bit different. Um, Gavin's at competitive when the lights come on. Like, I mean, the bigger the game, the better he would pitch at times. Mm. So, um, But I think they all have some discipline in their lives where the main thing's the main thing and nothing else distracts them from what they need to do that day to be very successful. Mm. That makes a ton of sense. So, uh, you know, being a competitor, discipline, uh, and and uh, a tireless, you know, ruthless work ethic, I'm sure, is is kind of what, you know, anybody who's listening to this can kind of take away from that, right? So uh, the the best players that you've been around, they just they manage to outwork others or just put in more quality reps, more quality work, pretty much than anybody else. And they're, I'm sure, they have that type of self realization that we were just talking about earlier, where it's like, okay, I should attack certain things, or you know, my my coaches will kind of bring that to light. But um, you know, I'm sure the work ethic. Obviously, man, that's probably leaps and bounds above. Well, I would say a belief, too. I mean, you've been around really good players, too, a belief in themselves, like mm. when maybe other people doubt them, like, hey, man, I hear what you're saying, but I'm, I'm good. They might not verbalize it, but I um, think about DJ LeMayhew, and I co recruited him, coached him at LSU. I just coached him his really? freshman year, and he super quiet. But, like, when he got in the box, dude, extremely competitive. Like, we didn't talk a whole lot. I mean, he was very respectful. We'd talk hitting or whatever, and we'd work and stuff. 
But when he showed up, it was to go to work. And when he stepped foot in that box as a freshman at LSU, dude, he didn't think anybody could beat him. It didn't matter if a guy was throwing, you know, a hundred or the best slider. Like in his mind, he was better than that guy. Ooh. And that quiet confidence, I think all of them, some of it is more brash with, but DJ's just the most humble, quiet dude off the field. But when he stepped in that box, he's like, I'm better than you. He didn't have to tell him. He just, you know, in his heart, in his head, he thought he was better than that guy on the mound. That's fantastic. That's fantastic. Coach, so I got, I got two more questions for you. Um, I wanted to touch on recruiting. So obviously to maintain that level of academic and athletic excellence, um, you need to be bringing in uh, the top tier talent. Um, so how, how would, if I was a high school player or a player in the portal, right? Obviously that's, that's, that's big nowadays, <laughs> man. How, how would I separate myself and stand out to you recruiting wise? How could I, you know, obviously if I'm a good athlete, good baseball player, that's one thing, man. But uh, you know, what, what other things, characteristics, if you're going out to see a player for the first time or the only time, uh, that could really stand out to you? Well, like you said, I think that the skill, you have to have some kind of skill where it attracts our attention. And then we go walk over to the coach and go, hey, how is Ian? Is he, is he a hard worker? Is he a great teammate? What kind of student he is? I mean, those conversations. But, you know, the way you interact with your teammates, I can tell you this. I told one of our camps this fall, I said, if you'll just play hard this day and age, you'll stand out. Like, it's amazing. We There's so much travel baseball and it. You watch kids barely jog onto the field and the game drags and nobody plays with any excitement. Um, I'm not saying you got to taunt somebody, flip the bat, look in there. Like I tell our guys, like you hit a jack, man, like look in our dugout, fire our dugout up. Like we don't need to look into the other dugout and stuff, but if you really want to stand out, just play hard. Like if I go watch you three days in a row, go, man, that guy, he might not be what he is going to be one day, but he's going to figure it out because the way he plays the game. Um, mm. And, I mean, you look look at some of our former teams. I mean, guys that are not the most talented. Lane Hoover's five foot eight, and he finished top ten in hits in, in the history of East Carolina. And I tried not to play him. Everybody doubted him, even myself, which is crazy as hell because I recruited him, you know. And I'm, you know, taking him out of the lineup because we got somebody that's more talented. And you're like, God, I was an idiot because he's the heartbeat of our team. Yeah. And he needs to be out there because he makes everybody else around him better. Um, so I think that's one way. And then I think we develop guys. I mean, you know, you were saying that about the walk-on stuff where our starting shortstop last year recruited walk-on. He's never received one dollar of scholarship money in East Carolina. He's a senior this year. Our starting catcher last year until this year had never received one cent of scholarship money from baseball until this year going into his fifth year. Um, those guys – talk about work and being consistent and just keep showing up. Joey Barini, our shortstop, his first two years, he just was one of the most clutch pinch hitters that I've ever coached. We would not have won some games if he could not come off the bench. And first pitch, 93, slaps a ball in the left field for an RBI. Like, it's like he's been playing the whole game. Like, I get chill bumps telling you this story because nobody thought he was any good, you know, and, like, the guy just got a short swing, boom, bam, clutch it, and then – worked his way into the starting shortstop role last year. And then Justin Wilcoxon worked himself into his fourth year to the starting catcher and could have had, you know, an opportunity to play professional baseball last year, but wanted to come back and finish his NBA and all that good stuff. So there's two walk-ons for you right there that that's, are on a, a good baseball team. That's great. So it's obviously like the resilience, hard work seems to be, you know, the theme of this. There's this little equation that I saw, volume times time equals skill. Right. So if, if we're, you know, we're the same athletic ability, if, if I'm putting in more volume, right, more reps, more time. Right. I hope the idea would be that my skill would develop a little bit more. I, I feel like that's that's the easiest I can break it down to the, the, you know, the younger generation of student athletes that are, you know, maybe they're talented, but they 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 don't work as hard. Right. right. Um, so we I've, I've seen a couple examples like um, Alex Bregman um, at, at at LSU. Um, I was seeing this, this is what we, we actually talked about this on the podcast. Um, so he's at LSU and he had to ask the coaching staff like, Hey man, uh, can I get access to the facility, uh, like 24 hours, uh, you know, just in case I want to hit at night. And then there's video on Twitter from back in the day when he's, you know, when he's there at LSU, um, you know, hitting in the dark, uh, just grinding, hitting up the machine on the field. Uh, it's dark out. No one's around. It's like, man, okay. That guy might not have the craziest body. He might not be six, eight. 
uh, like Chris Bryant type body, you know, at third base, man. But he's in there. He's in there putting in the work. It's crazy. For, funny story about Alex Bregman. Now, I've never I don't know Alex Bregman. Bregman, he doesn't know me. But Micah Gibbs, who played for me at LSU, was on the LSU coaching staff. And this was when I was here, when Bregman was at LSU. And I had talked to Gibby at some point in time. And he goes, man, the guy is just a machine. He goes, he called me at halftime during the Super Bowl and said, hey, let's go hit. And Gibby's like, hey, man, it's halftime of the Super Bowl. He goes, exactly. Nobody else in the country is hitting right now. Let's go hit. <laughs> that just blew my mind. Yeah. <laughs> that just blew my mind. And, and people wonder, you know, the, the top tier – talent that's in the MLB, you know, they don't see the hard work that goes in behind the scenes, man. So that's yeah. awesome. Um, last question I got for you again, I extremely grateful for your time. Um, what does a nine hole hitter, uh, kind of embody like to you? So when you think about a nine hole hitter, um, obviously depending on who you're playing, depending on who, you know, you're matched up against who's pitching them, the lineup might look a little different. Um, but when you think about a nine hole hitter, like what characteristics kind of come to your mind um, and, and what is a nine hole hitter to you? Well, I think over time that's changed, you know, and I think every team is a little bit different, but if you can have a guy in that nine hole spot, that is just a tough out. Like, you know, whether he's a home run hitter, whether he's a runner, what, you know, but if you can flip that lineup over and you've put together a quad, or maybe you just saw a lot of pitches, fouled a ton of pitches off and, you know, the leadoff hitter is going to get better pitches because the guy's like, geez, I just threw the nine-hole hitter ten pitches. And, yeah, he lined out or he got out, but, damn, like now i got to flip the lineup over and now i got to go through like dudes. And I think the nine-hole hitter is very selfless because, no offense, none of us signed up to play baseball to go, hey, I can't wait to go hit in the nine-hole. That's right. right? <laughs> but, um, you know, to be a great team guy I think uh, is a big characteristic of that nine-hole guy. Beautiful. Beautiful. Coach, uh, thank you so much for your time. Uh, Cliff Godwin, head coach, East Carolina Pirates. Um, absolutely honored to have you on the show. Thank you so much for your time, Coach. Well, Ian, thanks, man. And get to Gravel, man. We'll uh, we'll get you some tickets, man. Come hang out with us. Done. Done. I appreciate you, Coach. Looking forward to the continued success. All right, buddy. I'll see you, Ian. Yes, sir. Yes, sir.